122 students, I'm Professor Amanda Hudson, and today I'm going to be walking you through electrochemistry. Um, in particular, we're going to look at electrolysis and also voltaic cells, how you set them up, how you use them, all of that good stuff. Okay, let's get going. So first, we're going to look at voltaic cells. So all of these cells that we're looking at in lab today involve oxidation reduction reactions. So in a voltaic cell, we have that redox reaction that spontaneously occurs. So why this is important is because in a redox reaction that occurs spontaneously, as soon as the two processes are joined together, um, we can collect those electrons and be used for electricity. So these generate electrons to be used as electric energy. So let's take a look at how one of these cells is put together using the example of a copper zinc cell. So when we make a voltaic cell, they need to be separated into two compartments. So we have the oxidation half cell, we have the reduction half cell. Um, but until we join them, nothing happens. So they have to be joined in two ways. Um, so first we need to electrically connect them through a wire. So you'll see in lab today, when we set up these cells, we're going to connect them with a wire to let the electrons flow from one side to the other. Um, next is that you need to have a some sort of connection between the cells to regulate your ions. So on one side of the cell, we're gonna have a production of excess plus ions. As oxidation occurs, we're going to get a buildup of cations. So we need a way to keep that in balance. So we're going to have to supply some anions over there to keep that balance, sort of that, that charge balance. On the other side, um, we're going to see that positive charge is disappearing from that cell. So we're going to have to replenish it with some cations. So this can be done with what's called a salt bridge. So any sort of aqueous salt, you can put in a salt bridge and we'll see anions and cations flowing to one side of the cell to again, maintain that ion balance. Um, what you're gonna see in lab today is we're actually gonna use a porous membrane. So we're gonna have what's called a porous cup and it's going to connect them by allowing ions, like a free exchange of ions between the two half reactions. Okay, so let's go ahead and get our sort of cell built. So if I was going to do this in lab, I would have uh, one cup for one part of the reaction and it's sort of separate, separate cup for the next, like you see here. So I would start by putting an electrode in each of them, picking a side that you want to, say, connect the copper or the zinc to, um, and putting those in. So I'm going to put the copper electrode in one side and I'm going to submerge or put that copper electrode into a solution of copper ions. So in the reaction that's happening, either copper ions are going to turn into copper solid or the copper um, atoms themselves from the electrode are going to turn into copper ions. So we need a supply of both of them for either the oxidation or reduction reaction to occur. So the same thing is gonna be true with the zinc. You need the zinc electrode in the zinc solution. So again, we have zinc solid and zinc two plus. So whichever way that reaction is gonna go, we have the reactant present. Okay, so we connect these together. Um, so looking at the reduction potentials that we have, um, uh, copper is uh, plus three, four volts for its half reaction zinc is minus 0.76 volts for it. So we know the copper is the reduction cell because the most or, or the largest value is going to be your reduction. Okay, so 0.34 positive is larger than negative 0.76. So the copper is going to be the reduction side of the reaction, which means the oxidation is going to occur with the zinc. So as written, what we have over here, uh, as written, this is what's going to occur. So Cu2 plus copper ions in solution, grabbing two electrons to become copper solid. For the zinc, on the other hand, this in the cell, we're gonna actually see the reverse. Some of those zinc ions on that electrode are going to be oxidized into zinc two plus. So we're gonna increase the zinc two plus in solution 
um, and then we're going to generate those electrons. Okay, so next we can kind of look and see which way electrons are going to travel in this cell. Okay, so electrons travel from the oxidation cell to the reduction cell. So if you look, we reverse that reaction with the zinc. Um, so we are producing electrons. Electrons are a product of this reaction. So they're produced at the electrode and then can travel over to the copper side. Okay, so that's our flow of electrons. Okay, so what's next? Let's look at the charge of our electrodes. So the copper electrode is going to have a positive charge. Uh, in a voltaic cell, the reduction electrode has a positive charge, and the oxidation electrode has a negative charge. And that makes sense because we do know at that zinc electrode, electrons are being generated in that spontaneous process, so it should have a negative charge. Okay, so it looks like the last piece here is going to be the is going to be our flow of ions. So cations are going to flow to the reduction cell. So let's kind of think of why that's going to be. Um, so uh, in our reduction half cell, we have copper two plus becoming copper solid. So our cations in there, our positive charge is decreasing over time. So we need to replenish that. So in our salt bridge, cations are going to flow towards our um, reduction cell. The opposite is going to be true for our oxidation cell. Um, so over time, we are generating more zinc ions in solution. So as this cell continues to produce electricity, um, we're going to produce more and more zinc 2 plus ions in solution. So we need to add some negative charge there, again, to keep that balance of charge relatively neutral in that cell. Okay, so this is our nice voltaic cell. So what should we expect to measure when we hook this guy up and we connect our voltmeter and we take a reading? Okay, so our E cell, uh, the total voltage generated by this cell is equal to the reduction potential of our reduction in half reaction, subtract the reduction potential of our oxidation half. Okay, so we're gonna have our 0.34 volts, which is our copper, subtract negative 0.76 volts, which would be the zinc, to give us an overall of 1.10 volts. So when we plug this in, we would expect to see a reading on the voltmeter very close to 1.10 volts. So there are a few things, of course, that can change this. If we're not exactly at standard conditions, of course, we could measure something slightly different than this. Uh, but so long as we are at standard conditions or close to it, we should measure a voltage pretty close to that 1.10 volts there. Okay, so that's that was a spontaneous cell. In the next cell, electrolysis cell, this is a non-spontaneous process. So in a non-spontaneous process, we are supplying electrons in to make a non-spontaneous process actually happen. So all of our electrolysis cells are going to be occurring in aqueous solution. So when we start to look at what reactions are going to be happening, we also have to take into account that water can be oxidized and water can be reduced in an electrolysis cell. So let's take a look. So for this one, a um, little bit different of a setup. They do not have to be separated because this process is non-spontaneous. We're actually driving the process to happen. In the lab, we're going to be looking for a lot of evidence that the reaction is occurring. So we'll kind of take a look at this towards the end. Um, so for our example here, let's consider an electrolysis cell made of aqueous magnesium chloride. Okay, so aqueous magnesium chloride. Okay, so first of all, we put any electrodes in here. It doesn't have to be magnesium or chlorine, which is good because chlorine is a gas. Um, so we're going to use graphite. Um, electrodes here because, again, they're not actually involved in the process. Everything that's happening is going to be already contained in the solution. So we're going to hook this up. We're going to put the power supply in. So in our example here, we're supplying electrons to this electrode right here. Okay, so this makes it the reduction. The reduction is going to occur here where we are supplying the electrons. Oxidation is going to occur at the other side of this. 
Okay, so a little bit different. The polarity of the electrodes is switched in an electrolysis cell. So since we're pumping the electrons in, it's going to have a negative charge. On the oxidation side, it's going to have a positive charge. So the polarity of those has swapped. So our two processes that can happen is first for oxidation, like let's kind of think about what that means. Oxidation is loss of electrons. So something that already has a negative charge is a good candidate for being able to lose electrons. So chloride ions, because they have that negative charge, do have the ability to lose electrons. Magnesium, on the other hand, as magnesium two plus, really isn't in a position to lose more electrons. So oxidation is going to be from your anion. So we have our two chlorides that could be oxidized to chlorine gas and would lose two electrons in that process. On the other hand, magnesium is more in the process of gaining electrons. It has a positive charge, so not a stretch for say those two electrons to be gained back to form magnesium metal. Okay, so your cations are going to be reduced in an electrolysis cell gain those electrons back to form the solid. Okay, so I did mention that because this is aqueous, this isn't the only thing that can happen in this cell. So we can have the oxidation of water. Okay, so let's take a look. So if we look at our water, um, we have H2O. So kind of think of it as the same process that happened with our chloride. So our oxygen here, has an oxidation number of negative two. The hydrogen has an oxidation number of plus one. So if you look at which elements are capable of being oxidized, the hydrogen isn't capable. It has no more electrons. It's already sort of lost its electrons there to get that plus one charge. So our candidate for oxidation here has to be the oxygen. So the oxygen in water can be oxidized. So when it does, when it loses those electrons, it forms O2 gas. So the O2 minus is forming O2 gas. So we would need two waters to do this. So in doing that, each oxygen would need to lose two electrons. So we get a total loss of four electrons. And then that leaves our hydrogen ions free floating in solution as H plus. Okay, so the hydrogen we don't touch there the oxygen in this half reaction, the oxygen is being oxidized, the hydrogen isn't really doing anything. Okay, so now if we look at reduction, we're gonna have the opposite here. So in the reduction of water, again, same, same oxidation numbers here. Hydrogen is the plus one and the oxygen is the negative two. So again, if you look at what has the potential to gain electrons, that's definitely the hydrogen. Oxygen is not going to gain more electrons. So when hydrogen gains electrons, it forms H2 gas. So each hydrogen needs to gain those two electrons to form the H2 gas. Okay, so oxygen isn't going to be free floating as oxide ion in solution. It's going to be hydroxide. So that's why we have to have the two H2O. So out of those four hydrogens that we have there, two of them will be oxidized to H, or excuse me, reduced to H2 gas. And then the other two that are left are gonna retain that plus one charge and stay combined with oxygen to make hydroxide ion. Okay, so two hydrogens reduced to H2, two hydrogens staying combined with that oxygen uh, to form our hydroxide ion. Okay, so these reactions are competing in every single electrolysis cell that we build in lab. Um, they're all going to be competing with the anion for oxidation and the cation for reduction. So you'll have four that you can write out for each electrolysis cell. So how do we know which one is actually going to happen? Let's take a look. Okay, so we look up the reduction potentials for the four different reactions we have here, we can compare them. So here we have the reduction potentials for our two processes that can be involved at the anode. 
Okay, so again, they're written different than I have because this is the reduction potential. I wrote down the oxidation reactions here. So we're writing down the reduction reactions when we look up the reduction potentials. Okay, so for um, the reduction potential for water is plus 1.23 volts. And for chlorine gas, it's plus 1.36. So the one that's going to win out is the one that is the lower value. Okay, so the lower reduction potential is going to be the one that's going to be oxidized. So that sort of points out that it should be this one here. Looks like it's probably going to be the water. Okay, so if we look at the reduction potentials now of what's happening at the uh, cathode, um, we have the two H2O plus the two electrons to give us H2 and 2OH and then the magnesium. So for this one, if we compare those, the larger value is going to be the one that happens at our cathode. So for this one, it looks like it's going to be the water as well. So it looks like even though we have magnesium and chlorine in here, um, the water is going to be more easily oxidized and reduced in this cell than the magnesium and the chloride would be. So what could we observe in this cell? Well, um, because of the products of this reaction, uh, namely the OH, or excuse me, the H plus. So because we are producing H plus, we would be able to measure a low pH. So we'd be able to measure this solution as acidic. And because we are producing a gas, O2 gas, we would probably see some bubbles. So we would see little bubbles forming in solution all around this electrode. Okay, so what would we notice for the other part of this? What would we notice happening at the cathode? Okay, so look at what products we have there. We have hydroxide as a product. We have H2 gas. So we would see a high pH. Now we're producing hydroxide, so we'd see a much higher pH. And again, because of that H2 gas, we would also see bubbles. So again, high pH because of the hydroxide and little bubbles because of the hydrogen gas. Okay, so these are the things you're gonna look for when we have these electrolysis cells set up. So we're going to take account of measuring the pH. So we know if hydroxide or hydrogen ions are present at the anode or cathode. So again, that's a good indication if the water reaction is winning out. Uh, we're also gonna look for evidence of the cation reacting. So for example, can we see the metal plating out onto the electrode? That'd be a good indication that the metal is reacting. Or for something like Cl2 gas, would we see bubbles or anything that's characteristic of chlorine being that sort of yellow color that chlorine is. So these are all things that we're going to look for to figure out through our observations what's happening at that cell. So the last part of the lab, we're going to do some electroplating. So an electrolysis cell, again, we're going to use it to electroplate copper. So we're gonna have one of our electrodes being just a copper electrode and then our other one being a conductive metal that we wish to plate copper on top of. So some useful formulas and definitions that we're gonna need when we do this. So Q is the charge in coulombs. When we talk about Q as the charge in coulombs, we're talking about the charge that has passed or traveled through that cell over a given unit of time. So when we calculate Q in lab today, that's all the electrons that went into your cell to cause that electroplating to happen. Okay, next, we're gonna look at the current. So current is what you're calculating uh, from the calculations today. Uh, current is in amps, and that is a unit of coulombs per second. So when you're calculating the current, if you know the charge Q, and you can divide that by the time in seconds, you can get the amps. So time, we're gonna measure in seconds, again, because we're after amps. Um, for this, we're gonna use Faraday's constant, so 96,485. That is the charge of one mole of electrons in units of coulombs. 
and n n is the moles of electrons that have traveled through your cell okay so when we set up that electrolysis cell and we're electroplating we're going to calculate how many moles of electrons passed from the wall from the plug into that cell during the electroplating process that's n okay so a coulomb is equal to an amp times a second and we have a couple of relationships so q equals i our current times t but it also equals the number of moles times faraday's constant okay so q total charge can also equal moles times f okay so again note n is not what we use in the nernst equation this is not the stoichiometry one this is the n the electrons that went through that cell to cause that electroplating Okay, so let's look at an example. So this isn't exactly what you're doing today. In fact, I gave you the exact opposite of what you're doing today in lab, but just so you can see how all of these things are related together. So we want to calculate how many grams of magnesium will electroplate onto an electrode in a molten cell of magnesium chloride if 60 amps pass through the cell for 4,000 seconds. Okay, so we're given amps in time and we want to calculate grams of magnesium. For you in lab today, you will have grams of copper and you will have time and you're going to be calculating the current. Okay, so your reaction for electroplating, that's important because even though um, we're not using, or, or we did define N as being this moles of electrons that pass through, we are still gonna have to build some stoichiometric relationships here. So my reaction for electroplating, molten magnesium means Mg2 plus as a liquid, combining with two electrons to plate out as magnesium solid. Okay, so my total charge in the cell, I can get from the current times the time. So my 60 um, coulombs per second times 4,000 seconds gives me that a total charge of all those electrons that pass through my cell was 2.40 times 10 to the fifth coulombs. Okay, so in any good stoichiometry, we're just building relationships between things. So my question, of course, is how many moles of electrons was this? So that's the first step in my conversion that's kind of in this bluish color. I took my charge here, my total charge that entered that cell, and to find how many moles of electrons that is, I'm dividing that by Faraday's constant. Okay, so when I do this, the coulombs cancels with this coulombs. And now if I would stop here, I know how many moles of electrons were in my cell. Okay, so now I'm looking to my reaction. I know that it requires two moles of electrons to plate out one mole of magnesium. So now I am gonna use a little bit of a mole ratio here to get moles of electrons to cancel to tell me how many moles of magnesium that I can actually plate out with that charge that went through. Okay, so the last one it asks us for mass in grams. So then we're gonna multiply that by the molar mass of magnesium, to get moles of magnesium to cancel and leave us with grams of magnesium. Okay, so if I ran this cell for 4,000 seconds with that particular current, I could electroplate out 30 grams of magnesium. Okay, so that's what you're doing in lab today, except for one major difference. Again, I don't want to make it too easy for you here. One major difference is you are calculating it this way. You are starting with the mass of copper that you electroplated, you're working it backwards, and then you will calculate what current had to be flowing through that cell to electroplate out that particular mass. Okay, so here's that. I'll see you in the lab. We'll get our cells set up. Welcome to the experimental portion of the electrochemistry lab. So in this part, we are looking at non-spontaneous cells. So we have sort of our setup here. So in a non-spontaneous cell, we do not have to have the cathode and the anode separated. Um, so we're going to do the reaction of what's called a U-tube, not like the channel where you watch your videos, like the actual U-shaped glassware. Um, so we're going to take our salt and dissolve it into water. We're going to put it into the U-tube. We're going to use 
um, graphite electrodes, which we have right here. They're gonna go in one end to the other, and then we're gonna connect it to a power supply. So this plugs into the wall and is going to provide electricity for us to conduct our reaction. Okay, so today for reference, the black clip, whichever um, uh, electrode I hook it to is going to become the cathode. And the red, when I hook it up to this electrode, it's going to be the anode. Okay, so when you're making your observations, the black clip will be the cathode and the red will be the anode. Okay, so for this one, we are going to look at copper sulfate. So we have our mass of copper sulfate in here, and we're gonna add our 250 milliliters of water. Okay, so we're going to stir this, and we're gonna get that solid to dissolve to give us that lovely blue color that's characteristic of our copper ions in solution. but that is quite all right. We just need enough to be in solution here to fill up our U2. Okay, so I'm gonna pour a little bit now into the U2. Okay, not that much. Side. Okay, so we're gonna put our graphite electrodes in. So one on this end. We're going to put one on this. And so you're going to be looking at observations happening on and around these electrodes to help you determine which process is happening at each particular electrode. So recall that at the electrode, you can have one of two things happening. Um, on one of the electrodes, you can have the anion reacting, or you can have water reacting. And at the other one, you can have the cation reacting, or you can have water reacting. So make sure you observe closely so you can determine which one of the reactions is happening. Okay, so we're gonna plug this in. Okay, so we're gonna put our red one. And then we're going to attach our black one. Okay, so we're going to now make observations on what is happening at each of these electrodes. Okay, I'm going to place this back in here for just a second. We are going to test the litmus. Uh, so we're going to check for the production of acids and bases at each. Okay, so we have our litmus paper here. So I'm going to start with red. Okay, so red on this end. So red dipped in here, no change. This end, red, no change. So blue. Change to pink. So we did have a change in litmus here. And on this end, no change. Connect our cell here, and we are going to move to the next. So the next cell we're looking at potassium iodide uh, in our electrochemical cell. So we have our mass of Ki, and we have our 250 milliliters of water. Pour this in. Okay. This one's nice, it dissolves a lot faster. Give it a quick stir here. And it looks like that's all we need. All right, so, same thing. I'm gonna pour 
four. Okay, we'll put our two on the back. Same type of electrodes. Mix them in our cell. Here we are. We might need to move. Didn't bring an extension cord today. Right. It's with the pickle. <laughs> So we'll move back over here where we can make our observations. And we'll just use it. Okay, so same thing. I'm going to put the red on this side. And I'm going to put the black on this side here. Okay, we're going to make uh, our observations. Okay, so let's test, uh, test our acids and bases with our litmus paper here. We'll start with red again. So red on this side. Oh, no change, but it did bring something up with it. It's interesting. Observation there. This other side. Red changed to blue. Okay, quick test with blue. No change, but again, brought something interesting with it. And then on this side over here, blue, no change. Okay, so we'll disconnect this. And that was the iodine. So that's interesting. Take a quick look at now that I've turned the cell off. Lots of good observations to make on this one. So our final uh, cell that we're going to make is with salt or NaCl, regular old table salt. We got have that, and we're going to add the 250 milliliters of water. Get a nice clean stir rod and get the solid to mostly dissolve. here. Okay. Clean fresh electrodes. We'll place in. Okay, so plug our power supply in the wall here. Okay. So we'll go the same direction here. Alright, so I'm going to go grab the litmus paper. Okay, so same, we'll start with red. Okay, so red here, no change. Red here, turn to blue. this side. Blue turned to pink. And on this side here, no change. Okay, so here is the cell running really sort of nice and vigorously there. So make sure you record your observations there to figure out what process is happening at those electrodes. Okay, so we have uh, our solution of copper here. 
uh, for our electroplating. And today we are going to electroplate this nice quarter. So after we let this cell run for the designated time, the 15 minutes, we should see a nice coating of copper on here that is going to come from our electrode. Okay, so we're gonna set this up for our electrode to be on the red clip. Okay, so we'll put that in solution here. And we're going to have our quarter on the black clip here. So I want to get the quarter in here um, without getting my electrode in. So I'm gonna sort of get it submerged and I'm gonna do this super, super official taping of the wire to keep it into place. So we look down here, we have our quarter nice in solution there with our electrode. I'm gonna raise it just a little, I think. Okay, so our bottom portion now of our quarter in there with our electrode. Okay, so that portion that's submerged in the liquid there then should be where we get our electroplating. Okay, so obviously nothing's happening. I haven't plugged it in. So this is not a spontaneous process. The copper isn't going to just jump from the electrode onto the coin. So I'm going to go in, ahead and plug it in and get the cell going. So plug in. And if you take a look at the quarter, we already see that electroplating is starting to happen on the surface of that coin. So we're gonna let this run for 15 minutes and then we'll come back and look. Okay, so we have left this running now um, for actually a little bit extra time. You got an extra minute out of it. So when I disconnect this, I'm gonna watch the clock for counting down. It will have been 16 minutes. So kind of look at sort of your evidence of your copper here. So let me look at the clock and we're going to pull this in. Okay, just a minute here, and we'll pull it. Maybe, okay. All right, it's unplugged, so I've unplugged it. So that electroplated for 16 minutes. Okay, so when you do your calculations, this cell was running for 16 minutes here. Okay, so I'm gonna get the electrode out and dry it, and then we're going to put it on the scale, and we're going to get the mass of that copper electrode now after the electroplating process. So we're getting our final weight now of the copper electrode. So I have the scale teared. So we're going to place our electrode here on the surface. And here is the final weight now of the copper electrode after the electroplating process. So the mass of copper that ended up on our coin is going to be the difference between, well, you saw some of it ended up on the coin and some of it was dripping down into the beaker. Uh, but in theory, all of that mass that was electroplated, the difference between those is going to be what you use for your calculations. Okay, so for part C of the lab, we are looking to build voltaic cells so for voltaic cells, we have a spontaneous process that's happening. So we have to separate the um, oxidation cell and the reduction cell, and then join them together through our electric wire. Um, so again, we can harness those electrons. Um, and we also have to connect them through an ion exchange. And today we're using that through a porous cup. So in all of the cells we're gonna see, I'm going to have the copper in this white cup here. So we have 
our initial volume of copper here, about 100 milliliters, okay, going in. And now we have a nice, clean, shiny copper electrode. So this is going to be the cathode in all of our reactions. So I have it hooked up to the positive pole here. So that's going to go into the cup. Um, so our anode is going to differ for each cell, and that's going to be what's in the porous cup here. So the instructions say to put in um, about a equal level of volume that we have in our cup. So our cup is, you know, about here. So if we look, we're going to go about here in our porous cell. So we have for this one, our first one, the nickel electrode and we are using the nickel nitrate solution. Okay, so we're going to pour some in. Okay, so that's gonna give us roughly equal volumes. We're gonna put our nickel electrode into our nickel solution. And I'm gonna put the porous cup in here. We give it just a minute here to sort of start having our Electron or our ions flowing through the tube. Okay, so fair warning this one is going to be the reading that's going to be the smallest reading that we're going to have. So this cell doesn't generate much of a current. Um, so when you read your voltage from here, again, it's not going to move a whole lot. Okay, so when I hook this up, we should see a very tiny um, movement of that needle there. Okay, so I'm going to hook that up. And we saw the needle move slightly because, like I said, this cell doesn't generate very much. Okay, so this is our nickel and copper cell. Okay, so our next one, I'm going to unhook our nickel, leave it behind, and we're going to take our cup with us okay, and move just to the next cell. So our next cell here, we are building an iron copper redox cell. So again, we have our same copper in solution here. And now in our porous cup, we're gonna put iron sulfate and we have the iron electrode. Okay, so same thing, we're gonna pour in roughly equal heights of volume. We're going to put our cup in. Okay, so same thing. Our positive, our red, is going with our copper. And our black, going with our anode, which is the iron. Okay, so this one should give us a much better reading. So here is the voltage generated by our copper and our iron cell. Okay, so moving down the line, same thing, I'm going to take my copper cell with me, leave my iron behind. So next we have uh, the zinc, we have zinc sulfate and we have the zinc electrode. So again, pour a roughly equal height of volume in that cup. Place our cup in the solution here. So positive is our copper. And the negative is the zinc, so you should get a real good reading on this one. Okay, so record that one. So that's our voltage for our cell there. And our last one looks to be a magnesium cell. Okay, so I'm gonna hook this one and bring our cathode over. So we have a magnesium ribbon for this one. It's a nice long strand of magnesium and we're using magnesium sulfate. Magnesium is the only one you don't clean ahead of time because it will dissolve in nitric acid. Fun fact. Okay, so we'll put 
Penn students do that a lot. <laughs> All right, our last one here. Our, so I'll just hold this. This guy isn't quite as sturdy. So this one gave us a real nice reading here. To record your voltage now for this cell. So that concludes part C. And again, all of these cells were spontaneously generating a current that we were measuring here on this meter. So this was the voltage output for this electrochemical cell.